the healthy church. We've been in that series pretty good length of time. And we have taken short series studies in that subject matter of a healthy church to look at the New Covenant theology of the blood of Christ involved with the cup of the Eucharist. I felt it was important for us to go in there and discuss these things. <clears throat> Sometimes we memorize things and don't know what they mean. We, we go like, okay, we're supposed to take the cup. This is a cup in my blood. Do this as often remembrance of me. And we memorize reconciliation, redemption, propitiation, justification, sanctification, yeah, 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 yeah. And then sometimes we don't know what that really means. And so I thought I would come in and do a study on that <clears throat> so you'd have a better frame of mind about what that is when you take the cup of the Eucharist, <clears throat> that you would know that cup, what, the, what that cup represents, the blood of Christ, what it represents to your salvation. <clears throat> and so <clears throat> there are, there are nine doctrines in that cup of the, of the blood of Christ uh, for the new covenant. And we've looked at that. We're, in fact, today, if you'll notice on your paper, we're in the eighth of nine doctrines. Today is our ninth, uh, our eighth uh, doctrine of nine on the subject of the blood of the cup of Christ. So here we are in chapter 12 looking at verses 7 through 12, and our title is Victory in the Angelic Conflict. It's all be victory in the angelic conflict. You're in the angelic conflict, whether you realize it or not, because we live in the devil's world. Uh, John <clears throat> chapter uh, 10, well, all the way from 14 through 16, but in 16, he nails it. First uh, John 5, 19. Uh, Satan is the God of this world business. And uh, we have uh, in this Revelation passage, look at verse 7 with me. Uh, we're going to go from verse 7 uh, through 12. Uh, there was a war in heaven. Michael, the, the archangel, Michael and his angels waging war with the dragon, which we know was going to be another archangel, uh, after the fall, known as Satan, the devil, the evil one, etc. Uh, and the dragon and his angels, we got Michael and we have the dragon and his angel waging war, war in heaven. And they were not strong enough, and there was no longer a place found for them, the, the dragon and his angels, in heaven. And the great dragon was thrown down, out of heaven to earth, the serpent of old, who is now called the devil, Satan, who deceives the whole world. He was thrown down to the earth, and his angels were thrown down to earth with him. And I heard a loud voice in heaven. Now, let me hold a moment before I get to this. Look at verse 3 and 4. Look at verse 3 and 4. Another sign appeared in heaven. Behold, a great red dragon, which we have discussed, having seven heads and horns, and on his head were seven diadems. His tail swept away a third of the stars of heaven, that's angels, and threw them to the earth. And the dragon stood before the woman who was about to give birth, so that when she gave birth, he might devour her child. Okay? There's a story that begins with Eve that runs all the way to Mary and the virgin birth. Now, here's my point. We're told there that how, how many of the angels were swept away with the devil in a revolt in heaven? One-third. Now, how many that is, we don't know. But that's got to be a lot because when he, every time he goes to talk about how many angels there are, he compares it to stars. And we're learning a lot about stars. I mean, we're learning a lot at stars. <laughs> okay. So now we're back. Back to our passage. 
thrown down. There's war in heaven. And a third of the angels are going to choose to revolt with the devil uh, in heaven. I heard, a, I heard a loud voice, verse 10, I heard a loud voice in heaven saying, now, the, now, watch this now, now the salvation and the power and the kingdom of God and the authority of his Christ, which was the reason for the revolt, because in eternity past at the Eternal Life Conference, God revealed that the centerpiece of the plan of God was Christ. And Satan led a revolt against because he wanted that position. We know it from history. Now, I heard a loud voice in heaven saying, now that the devil's been booted out and sent to earth, and Christ is the centerpiece of the plan of God, which involves salvation, power, Pay attention. The kingdom of God and th authority now resides in the person of Christ that we know historically as Jesus Christ. Jesus being the virgin birth child. <clears throat> Salvation, power, that's what this whole eternal life conference was about that was revolted over. That Christ would be the salvation, the power, the kingdom of God and the authority of Christ has come for the accuser, the dragon, now called the devil, Satan, and the evil one, for the accuser of our brethren, the accuser of our brethren on earth, where he is the God of the world, the accuser of our brother has been thrown down, that is the dragon with a third of the angels, that's Satan and a third of the angels. He, he was, in eternity past, he was called Lucifer. After the fall, he's called Satan, the devil, and the evil one. Now, pay attention to how, how much he accuses you. Who is he accusing? He's an accuser, right? He's an accuser. That, that, that makes him the devil. When he's Satan, he's the adversary. When he's the devil, he's... I'm going to show it to you in a minute. He's the accuser. When he's evil one, he promotes evil. Who's he accusing? The brethren, the believer, those who have come through salvation... Those who have come through salvation, Christ died for your sin, was buried and raised from the dead third day. Those that are saved are under his power in his kingdom, right? Under his authority. Boy, you better understand that because this is where you are today. If you believe that Christ died for your sins, was buried and raised from the dead, you now are in his salvation. You're under his power. These are all good things. You're in his kingdom and you're under his authority, not the devil's. If you are not in Christ, if you are not saved in Christ, then you are under the devil system, which is in opposition to all these four things. Where was that determined? It was determined at the Eternal Life Conference and eternity past. A war was issued over it, and the centerpiece of the plan has just been now revealed to us. Now watch, the brethren... Now, who's accusing them? Satan, right? <laughs> because they're in, the king, they're, they're in salvation, under the power, <laughs> in the kingdom, under authority. You with me? All right. Now watch. And, and, and who is the brethren? We're the brethren. We're the brothers in Christ. God is our father. Right? Okay. Accuses us how much? Day and night. I mean, there is no poem. There is that that sums up a day. Agreed? Morning and night, day one. 
right? Morning and night, that sums up a day. So how, how much does he accuse us? Every day, morning and night. That's a whole lot of, I mean, most, that's a whole lot of accusing, isn't it? And we know from Job who he accuses us to. Who do you think he, who's he making, who's he making these accusations to? Not about. We know who, it's, who, he's, who, he's, who he's accusing. We know who it's about, but who is it to? God. That's the story of the book of Job, chapter 1, chapter 2, if you're interested. Now watch this, verse 11. They, the brethren who are being accused day and night by Satan, they overcame him because of the blood of the Lamb and because of the word of their testimony and because they did not love their life even to death. How about that? Are you there? Is that a picture of you? Well, if it's not a picture of you, he's not accusing you day and night before the Father. But if that is you, he's accusing you day and night before the Father. Let me have a piece of him. Let me get my hands on him. He'll curse the day he ever knew you, right? Well, you had studied at least the first and second chapters of Job. That's a good thing to be accursed, accused, accursed, or accused. It's a good thing to be accused by Satan in the presence of God because it shows that you're doing the Lord's work. You're serving as an ambassador and a priest and all the 20 status privileges that you have in Christ, that you've activated all these things. All these things that God gave you in salvation are being applied to your life on a daily basis. Christ is, he's a son, you're a son. He's eternal life, you're eternal life. He's a priest, you're a priest. He's an heir, you're an heir. He has an inheritance, you have the inheritance. And the list goes on and goes on and goes on. When you began, when you began to live up to whom God has saved you to be, you will be ac accused and you will be accused day and night. And what a wonderful idea that is. For this reason, verse 12, and for this reason, you know what for this reason is? The results of the war is now on earth. The war is now on earth. The war is no longer in heaven. The war is on earth. Do you know where your victory is? Do you know that the victory is in the blood of Christ? And every time you take that cup, you should think about your reconciliation and your redemption and propitiation. You should think about that, but you should think about victory, the victory over Satan as the God of this world. You have the power over him. You have the authority over him in Christ. And that makes you an overcomer. The word overcomer is a very important word to your life. You're not an overcomer because you're smart, because you're whatever you think you are. You're an overcomer because of the blood of Christ and the power that dwells in you is greater than the power that dwells in the world in Satan himself. 1 John 4, 4, greater is he who is in you than he who is in the world. You are an overcomer, and you let the world, listen, you sit on top of the world. You're king of the world. You shouldn't be the pauper of it. You shouldn't be the low man on the totem pole on the earth. You should, you're at the top of the, you're at the top of the food chain. Not the bottom, spiritually speaking. For this reason, watch this. For this reason, rejoice, O heavens, 
and you who dwell in them. You know who that is? Elect angels, who did, those who weren't in the fall, and believers. Church age believers, to die is to be in the presence of the Lord. Where is he? Third heaven, 2 Corinthians 12. He's in, the second, he's in the third heaven. That's where you are. The moment you leave this earth, you go to be in the presence of the Lord. Those who dwell, where is that? Heaven. It's called the third heaven by Paul in 2 Corinthians 12. For this reason, for this reason, because he accuses us day and night, because for this reason, not only are we saved, but we're a threat to his kingdom. We're a threat. You know why? Because we're evangelical. How do, how do you rescue anyone in the kingdom of Satan into the kingdom of God? Colossians 1, 13 and 14. You preach the gospel that he's come, Christ came to die for your sins, to be buried and raised from the dead. And the moment you believe it, he rescues you from the domain of darkness and transfers you into the kingdom of the beloved son. Colossians 1, 13 and 14. You should read that. Not now, but later. For this reason, for this reason, oh, the, oh rejoice, O oh heavens, and you who dwell in them, and woe, notice the contrast, woe, woe to the earth and the sea because the devil has come down to you having great wrath, knowing that he has only a short time. You know what his short time is? We live in the short time. The church exists in the short time. You know what the short time is? The time between the first coming of Christ and the second coming. If you know anything about eschatology, you know the devil has already been under judgment. And when Christ came into the world, things really heated up. When he died on the cross of Mary and when he was raised from the dead, things really heated up. And when he went back to be seated at the right hand of God the Father, things got out of hand. And the short time the devil has is between the first coming and the second coming because at the second coming, he's going to be thrown into a lake of fire. The judgment. We are overcomers. We have all of that on our side as pluses. <laughs> Eschatology is all the pluses for us, the church. The church is in the short time. God must be thinking from a heaven viewpoint because it's been 2,000 years. It's called the short time. That's a phrase he's used in the military a lot. What are you? They'd say a short timer. I mean, he was close to getting out. Short timer. If I had a word of prayer, if I had prayer, I better stop and have prayer because my engine's starting to get revved up. So let's pray. You know that the Bible is a spiritual book for spiritual people, for spiritual living. You can't learn it, nor can you live it. In carnality, evidence of carnality is personal sin. It could be mental attitude sins. It could be sins of the tongue or overt sins. These must be confessed in silence and privacy because of the indwelling Holy Spirit in the life of every believer. 1 Corinthians 6, 19 and 20, your bodies become the temple of God, a place where God dwells because of the blood of Christ has cleansed it. Mental attitude sins, sins of the tongue and overt sins must be confessed to allow you to be, get back into fellowship with, the, with God through the ministry of the Holy Spirit because carnality is evidence you're living in the flesh and the flesh produces sin. And the only way back is to confess that sin and come back to the ministry of the Holy Spirit. This is because of the blood of Christ. It's extended to the Christian life through confession. When you confess your sin, 1 John 1, 9, he is faithful and just to forgive you and to cleanse you from all unrighteousness. And so, our Father, we come to you today and look for this <clears throat> message, victory in the angelic conflict. 
the victory has been won. It's a matter of living it out and embracing it in the Christian life. I pray today the Holy Spirit would minister the truth of that to our lives in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, we've looked at that. Under point number one, I broke it down into four sections of study. And when you go back, I would, I would encourage you to do that. Sometime this week, go back and look at the way it's been broken down. There is this angelic war in heaven in verses 7 through 9. Remember, you want to pick up verse 3 and 4 with that to know how many revolted, rebelled, Michael and the dragon, and, and that's before the fall. After the fall, he's called the old serpent. That's Adam and Eve's business. And then he's called Satan, the devil, the evil one. He's given all these names of who he is in the world. You really need to know that. I mean, when he wears, when he says he's Satan, he has a mask that he wears. And when he says he's a devil, he has a mask he wears. When he's the evil one, he's, this is the character of him. And he identifies himself. Now, all the time when he's talking to believers, he's revealed as an angel of light, which was his formal status. When you read 2 Corinthians 11 chapter, and it says that he reveals himself uh, as an angel of light. That's who he was originally, Lucifer, the archangel. I mean, he understands how to behave like an angel of light, even though he's the angel of darkness after the fall. So in verses 7 through 9, we have an angelic war in eternity past. A war. In verse, in verse 10, 12th chapter, verse 10, we're, talked to, we're given an attitude about the authority of Jesus Christ. You really want to read this Ephesians 1, 20 through 23 because it talks about when he returns after victory at the cross and he returns back to the throne, seated at the right hand of God the Father. Ephesians 1, in fact, the whole first chapter is devoted to that whole subject matter and how that affects our life on earth in Christ. I, I, I am appalled how many Christians don't read the Bible, and when they do it, they don't study it. I am appalled by it. This is your key book. If you're going to read any book, this is the book you ought to read. This is the book that gives you the whole picture of the human race, the whole picture. You get the whole picture. Now, we look at this thing, and it says salvation, power, kingdom, and authority, right? We just read that. That's our situation because he goes to the cross, he's buried, he's raised, and he ascends back and seated at the right hand of God the Father. When he's seated there, salvation is in, everything is in, is in full motion. And when that happens... The devil, from the point of the death on the cross to the ascension of Christ, he's now into short time. Because once the first coming comes, the second one is the next one you look for. The period between the first coming and the second coming, God calls it short time. And for the devil who came out of eternity, he understands short time in a way you and I don't. Okay, we understand from verse 10 that the, he that Satan is the accuser of the brethren, that he's been thrown down to earth and he accuses us day and night. Now, you, if you're a carnal believer, he, he doesn't because, well, it's obvious. You're on the bench. You belong to a team, but you never play. You never practice. You're a dud. Now you are saved. You're not a threat to his, to his work. You're not a threat. A carnal person is not a threat because he lives like an unbeliever, but he's a believer. What will happen to him? Well, he'll be disciplined by the Lord. He'll be disciplined because God loves him. He belongs to God. And he'll be disciplined. Hebrews, the 12th chapter. Hebrews, the 12th chapter, is your chapter for that. 
And then it talks about the, the affirmation of victory in the angelic conflict. Watch this word. Watch this word. They overcame, they overcame by the blood of the lamb. Nakeo. See Nakeo? That's where you get the word Nike. That's where you get the word Victor. The word in the noun form, it's Victor. Nike. Nakeo is the victory. What, what, how do you get the victory over Satan? How do you get it? Listen, as a gift. And you get it the moment of salvation. Victory over Satan by the blood of Christ. I didn't make it up. I just read it. And I'll tell you something else. Notice that the word overcome, nakeo, notice it's aorist, active, indicative, third person plural. Every believer in the Lord Jesus Christ has victory over Satan positionally the moment he's saved. How do I know it? Put it in the aorist tense. He put it in the aorist tense. Means important time, a point in time, divorce from time. That has any, uh, that, that's connected to something in the past. The moment you believe the gospel of Jesus Christ, you are connected with God's divine plan that occurred in eternity past that says when a person believes in Christ, the centerpiece of the plan of God, the blood of Christ gives him victory. He has it from that day forever, victory over the devil. That's the heiress tense. The heiress tense is a point in time when you believe you become an overcomer that's connected to the eternal plan of God. I mean, it just, it just disturbs me so bad when I, I hear Christians moaning and groaning and, and fussing with God about their life. Oh, my life, my life sucks. How is that possible? How is that possible? You are an overcomer. You're not the one that's been overcome. You're the overcomer. You're not the one who's been overcome. You're the overcomer. They overcome. I mean, how is it possible? I'll tell you how it's possible. You went carnal. First Corinthians, the third chapter. You're not paying any attention to that stuff. You ought to be paying attention to First Corinthians 2.14 to the chapter 3, verse 3. You ought to pay attention to that stuff. When you, when you walk in the flesh, i.e. carnal, you're out of the game. You're still saved, you, but you're not in the game. You're on the bench. You belong to a team. You've chose to take yourself out of the game, and you're sitting on a bench. And everybody else is fighting your war. And you feel like you're a loser, not a winner. How is it possible that you as a believer under the blood of Christ thinks of yourself as a loser when you're a winner? Overcomer means you're a victor, not a victim. When you sit on the bench, you're a victim. You have a victim's mentality. You're like the people of Israel that said, oh, compared to the problems we have, we're grasshoppers. How is that possible? I'll tell you. you have, listen, listen, the devil already, listen, he's not worried with you. You've taken yourself out of the game. You did it yourself. Let me tell you. A believer who understands he's overcomer, if he, hey, listen, if he's knocked down on his back, he will fight on his back with his sword. If he's knocked down on his face, he will fight with his sword. He never surrenders. He's a victor. He will die a victor with his boots on, with his sword in his hand. What is wrong with us in the Christian church today? We surrender over the foolish things. We give you a lollipop and you're, you're gone for the day. We're bought off so easy by the devil. 
Our choices in our life are pitiful. We whine and cry about things that God says, I will give you plenty if you stop whining. Hey, who told you he would give you your daily bread? Why don't you start living for God? Why don't you start trusting God? You sit around and whine about the stuff Father's already promised you. You, won't, you already got a cash ready to be. You got a check in your hand. You won't cash it. I don't know who I'm talking to. I, didn't, I don't know your name. I'm talking to somebody, though. Even if it's on the Internet. I'm talking to somebody. Listen, they overcame by the blood of the Lamb, one. Number two, by the word of their testimony. You see, listen, you can get saved. Never take yourself out of the game. Listen, the second most important thing after the blood, the second important thing is your testimony in the world. Your testimony for Jesus Christ in this world. You have no idea how many people you pass by every day that need a word of prayer. You have no idea because you have your blinders on. You think that whatever, wherever you're going from point A to point B is the most important thing you could do, and you miss everything in between the trip from A to B. What about all that stuff in between there, short timer? What about all that? You don't pay any attention. You see, you've got to learn to start living your life in the moment daily. There is so much that passes your life because you're not, you're not awake and paying attention. I got lost on an elevator. Yeah, because it's supposed to take it to a certain floor, get off and go to another elevator and take it to another floor. I rode that elevator from floors to floors. I just was, finally, a guy comes by, and he's, he's got a hospital uniform on, you know what I mean? Looks like a hospital guy, stuff of coat, and all that stuff hanging out from him. I'll say, hey, buddy. Could you help me? I know where I'm parked, but I don't know how to get there. He said, well, where are you parked? I said, I I'm at 4P. I can tell you exactly where I'm parked, but I don't know how to get there. It's a miracle I got down, got down to where I was supposed to go, but I couldn't get back up. Well, I got back up, but, I, you know, I was just traveling on. One elevator up, one elevator down, one up, one down, and pfft. this would be all day here. Well, he said, yes, sir, I can help you. I went, thank you. So we went through the elevator uh, mystery. And so we got in this, when we got off the one elevator, there were a lot of people. When we got off there, we got in the next elevator. He was taking me up. To where I was supposed to go. And the Spirit of God said to me, You know, it's not about an elevator. You're not lost because of an elevator, Ron Adaman. You know it. So quit this foolishness. I went, Yes, sir. You're absolutely right. I said to that young guy, Tell me a little something about where you work. And he told me, we were at the same place. He worked in a different unit, the same place I went. So we talked a little bit about that. I said, hey, can I just, can I tell you, I don't believe in accidents or fate or coincidences, but I can tell you something. I'm not on this elevator to get to no floor. I'm in this elevator for you. Well, he looked kind of strange at me. I said, well, let me explain what I mean. I think he was getting kind of uncomfortable with me. <laughs> and I said, look, there's something going on in your life that we need to pray about. 
God put me this on this elevator with you, my son. Now, you're going to get me to where I need to go, and I'm going to get you to where you need to go. Because this ain't about an elevator ride. This is about you. He got tears in his eyes. I said, what you want me? We're going to have prayer. What you got, boy? What you got in your heart? You need to, we need to pray over right now. Get this thing done. He said, I've been married one year and I'm having marital problems. And he said, it's just killing me. I said, we're going to fix that today. We're going to fix that thing today. We're going to fix it. We talked a little bit. We had our prayer. We got off the elevator, and he's walking with me. I think he's lost. And just to talking to me. I said, okay, let's stop. Let's stop talk. Let's do some things. You and your wife... Believer, we went through that. You have a church, we went through that. You have a pastor, we went through that. I said, here, I want you to do. I'm going to give you some scriptures. I want you to just go home and study them with your wife. We're going to fix this thing. And you go to your pastor. Tell him what you're going through. You're just going through the normal stuff, buddy. But, but it, it can become terrible if you don't fix it, just like you let something go that you ought to have it, the doctor look at, and you let it go, and the first thing you know, it's, it's a mess. And if you can't get this resolved in a month, you, get, you do this right away. I mean, I mean, you get home, and you get this done, and you get this done now. <clears throat> Your pastor, he's on call 24-7. If he's not, here's my number. Here's my card and my number. You call me. I'm a 724 guy. I tell you, don't you let this go one more day because we can fix it. I mean, it can be fixed. And if, this, if it doesn't get fixed within a week, you call me. Now, I don't have anybody else's life to talk about, so I have to talk about mine. All right? But I'm telling you what God has taught me. What God has taught me is that I'm on call all the time. And I need not to overlook what is obvious in my path. I must not overlook what God is obviously doing in my life. I must not overlook it. It's never about what it looks like until your eyes open and you look, oh, there's a person. I wonder what's going on in their life. Why would God put me on an elevator with this young man? It's not about a parking space. That's for sure. Look, we're at war, and we can rescue these people. I spoke to that young man with such confidence. He said, I've, nobody's ever talked to me that way. And that's a shame. We, we, listen, we, we are winners. We're not losers. We're winners. We are winners. We are overcomers. There's nothing, there's nothing in anybody's life that we can't overcome them with. The blood of Christ is the secret for success. The blood of Christ. It puts us in a position already to be a winner, right? An overcomer by what? The blood of Christ. Number two, by our testimony. I carry that with me now. I carry that as a life card. I carry it everywhere with me in my heart by my testimony. When I find somebody that needs a testimony of confidence of an overcomer, this guy is just beat down and he doesn't need to be. He doesn't. And I shared with him, look, you're an overcomer. And I don't feel like it. I know it. I know it. And it, it is always interesting how you're reading a passage and then he gives you to somebody the passage is important to. I, I'm already in this subject matter. I've got, this is in my heart. I'm already preaching it. 
in the middle of the week. And he gives me this young man that needs to be heard, that you're an overcomer by the blood of Christ and the testimony. And, and listen to what else he says about that. Overcomer. They, over, they overcame him, the devil, because of the blood of Christ, because of the word of their testimony, and they did not love their life even to death. <laughs> not even to death. The devil likes to hang the fear of death over us. Tell him, get lost. I don't have, death is not a worry in my life. I have eternal life. Death, death has been destroyed. Death is no longer an issue. Life, I go from life to life through death. It's a door of entrance. Exodus on the one side, entrance on the other side. We need to be more than conquerors. We need to be more than conquerors. We need to be overcomers. I say that to you out of a heart that we can become overcomers in the air as the act of indicative, and we can carry that to our testimonies, and we can take it to our deathbed. I held old Aunt Bice's hand as a young rookie pastor and watched her leave this life to the next one, shouting with joy to meet her Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. What a day that was in my life as a young pastor, holding her hand, just got through reading the Bible to her, and she, she began talking to the Lord. And she wasn't even, I wasn't even there anymore. She got happy talking to the Lord and was gone, slipped right out into eternal rewards. How wonderful that is. Do you know that? Do you know 1 John 3, 8? Do you know that? You should. If you're interested in this subject today, I know she didn't write it down. I think you'd probably think I did. I don't know if I did or not, but I know you ought to write it down. Do you know that verse? You, you should because Christ provided that verse for you, the victory of that verse. Christ has provided in your salvation. Hebrews 2.9, Hebrews 2.14. <laughs> I love 2.14. He says that Christ rendered the devil powerless over your life. <laughs> he rendered Jesus Christ at Calvary, rendered the devil powerless. You know, I say it all the time out of 1 Peter 5. 8 there when he talks about 7 and 8 when he talks about the, the devil is a roaring lion I said yeah but he's toothless he can gum you to death but he can't bite you he rendered him powerless did you know that did you know that well I've, I've ran out of time for the first hour just speeded right through that that's, that's called short time <laughs> So, Rick, I guess you have the offering plate. So let's have a word of prayer. The men will take the offering for those who are members of the church, those who are visiting, just sit tight. This meal's been paid for. Compliments of grace. The men will take the offering, then we'll take a 15-minute break, and we'll come back to this subject matter. There's a whole lot more to be said, okay? A whole lot more. I haven't really even gotten into it. Let us pray. Our Heavenly Father, we thank you today for the victory to be the overcomers through the blood of Christ and through our testimony, even unto death. <laughs> oh, Father, give us the courage to live that. Let us stop getting so caught up with the things of the world, places to go, people to see, things to do, that we miss people. We miss people. Everybody's in a hurry. But listen, 
they got enough time to stop and have prayer about the real problems of their life. They are tearing their guts out. We can be those overcomers for them, and we can remind them of this wonderful thing in their life when they're believers like this young man. We thank you for all those opportunities that we have to do that every day from morning, afternoon, and evening. Thank you for all the opportunities. Let us not miss any of them. Let us not miss any of them. Encourage our hearts, Father. May we be good stewards of all the money you give us, Father, to support missions and ministries, for that's what we're all about. In Jesus' name, amen.